It used to be there. It used to be there. Actually, it used to be in the double basement yes. here. So what was the, the journey between ear and ear? <laughs> I guess it was about 10 years. <laughs> I can't even believe it's been 10 years. But what happened? Um, well, actually, not, not too much. It, it's just been before I was sitting there, I was always behind a camera. And it was just every year, another couple of videos. Every year, a new collaboration. Every year, um, a new project. And and just kind of, I think I said this in my social post. It's like it can't stop, won't stop. Like I started in high school, and uh, I ha I have like <laughs> plans for films for the next two three years ahead of now. So, yeah. and how do you define yourself today? What is your title? That's, that's an interesting uh, question. Because I have a long list here. Yeah, yeah. That's a, so that's... I prefer that you give me your long list yeah. of oh, stuff. titles. Um, yeah. Well, I went, from being, I went from being a camera operator. I went from being a, a young, like, high school aged person <laughs> with a tiny VHS camera, uh, really interested in, like, punk bands and, like, community radio. I was, I'm from Kitchener-Waterloo. So I was kind of involved in the University of Waterloo radio station. Um, not much different than the one CHUO here. Uh, and when I came here, it was the first place I went. Like I kind of always thought of myself as a technician first. And it took me a very long time to identify as an artist mm -hmm. and then as a director. Um, someone that was like, I more was the person people would come to and be like, I have this crazy idea. Like, do you think we could do this? Like, I, you know, I, or I, I would just, I just love technology. So I'm just really interested in like all the different developments of it in different, in different cameras. And I, I like the VHS aesthetic because I like aesthetics that challenge kind of normal, like normal codes of, of beauty and, and of aesthetics. Like we can see in, in Murder at the Circus, my creative collaborator, that's her second film, um, we really wanted to show something that was outside of cinema, but still a part of cinema, like something more about performance art, something more like, you know, early Lars von Trier stuff. It was like a stage and actors is all you really need um, to be able to convey a story or an idea. Uh, I guess, I mean, I think if you wanted to yeah. really break it down, like I do have a history in, in theater, um, I, I did like workshop training at Queens when I was in high school as a musical theater person. And the first year I did it, I actually did it in, in media communication, but the, the second year I did it, I was on stage as a musical theater participant, like as a performer. And then the second year I went back to Queens to do um, this, these advanced training programs. I was like, I want to be in the tech. So I did theater tech because I kind of realized I was like, you're on stage, but the, it's the people behind the stage that kind of have the control that are, they're the people who are choosing the actors. They're the people who are choosing the lighting. And I was really interested in like lighting boards and, and, uh, and that kind of maybe comes back to my history of like, my father was a, was a lighting director at the Banff's Art Center in Alberta. And my mom was the set designer and the head of um, wardrobe and costume design um, for like large mm -hmm. operas. So that's where they met. And then they moved to Ontario. <laughs> um, but yeah. Just to come back to the question about um, you say that it was difficult for you to call yourself an artist. So when, which moment, when did you start to say, I am an artist? So what helped you to say, I am an artist now? That's a good question. Um, oh, it was so many, so many little steps. So I had already had a, like a, I had a sold out painting show at like Venus Envy. Um, in my, yeah, in my first, when, when I was in university, and I was like, because I, again, like these art projects would fall out of me, like I couldn't not do them, it was just something that kept happening, and, and I, I had to drive to do it, and even after doing a full painting show, I was like, you know, I just paint sometimes, or like I just do this sometimes, because I was in university for like media and communications, I kind of figured I would go into marketing and be like, a behind the scenes person, which I, I do with my production company mm -hmm. now, but um, honestly, I 
it took a very long time. It wasn't until my creative partner really pushed me and he was like, you have a screenplay, like you have these ideas, like you are an artist. And I think really bridging out on my own, I went from going to school here um, and like working at Bridgehead and at the Bytown Cinema for like eight years. Uh, yeah, where part of Murder was filmed. And, uh, and that's where I met my creative collaborator, one of my creative collaborators, and who was a theater director. And then this, basically the theater director, his name is Matt Miwa, he was like, you seem to always have these cameras and are running around with cameras. Like, I got this grant from this art center and I'm, I want to make, I'm making this like, this like, you know, like asinine comedy about like, like queer science fiction. And I was like, I am there and I will help you. And I walk into Saw Video where my professor had mentioned it to me and I was like, whatever. And then <laughs> I like walked through the doors and I was like, what is this place? And they're like, it's an art center. And I was like, what does that mean? Like I just, I had grown up in the suburbs. It was very like sheltered. Mm -hmm. I had no, my own, like it was only through my own like discovery of like alternative music and like mm -hmm. seeing kind of community organizations and, and learning that way. Cause my family wasn't, wasn't from Kitchener Waterloo. We just kind of ended up there. Um, and just, couldn't stop going to SAW. I didn't have any money, so I asked if I could volunteer and I could trade hours for camera rentals because mm -hmm. cameras at that time were way more expensive than they are now. Um, and then I knew I wanted to take the video one class. And then after doing video one, it was just, it was a very natural progression. I had been there every day and my, well, another one of my film mentors, Ariel Smith, was the head of production at SAW. And she said, there's a position opening at SAW you just graduated from university, why don't you apply for it? And I was like, I don't want a job. <laughs> I don't want a real job right now. I'm leaving Ottawa. And, uh, and I applied and it was, you know, it was, the, it was the job I got right out of high school, or sorry, out of university. So having um, steady income was the first time in my life. I felt secure financially. So I just started making more and more more videos. And I started doing a lot of music videos at that time. Um, mm -hmm. And because I started doing music videos, a record lab label took notice, and they kind of headhunted me out of Saw Video. They were like, come to the music industry. It's so much better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it kind of was. It, you know, it, there's a bit of, there's, it's, just, it's just different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I always just love music, and I'm a musician too. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, so I started just working as like a, a manager and, and like a uh, like an A and R person for for a record label for a couple of years, and then some things kind of shifted at that company and and I was like I'm out like I I had been had been doing film stuff in my spare time for so for so long and because I had so many other artists ask me for music video stuff and documentation and just seeing the breadth of what. Um, you can do in a tool set, especially a technical um, tool set. I could be doing location sound, I could be doing camera things. I, I just saw an opportunity as a freelancer to really, mm -hmm. you know, take, take control of the things that I was already doing and make that my full-time thing. But, yes, um, personally, I, I didn't produce any music video yet. Can you explain? Anytime, anytime. Know, you want you one? Let's do one this summer. No. I got two bands. <laughs> Everyone needs a music video, okay? <laughs> I love that too as an art form, but can you talk more about, because, you know, when you watch a music video, you, you know, it's, you say, oh, that's great, and you get engaged with the visual and the audio and stuff, but it's not easy. It's not easy. It's easy to direct a music video. No. Can, can you explain the challenges of a music video? Yeah, music videos are so interesting, and I was, I was explaining this to an artist yesterday just talking about you know what what it is you're you're using you know these visual tools for you know for me it's 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 something that comes out of me I must do it I must make this video um, other times it's like we need a promotional element to promote a new album um, and we also want it to be artistic you know it's kind of, that's kind of a nice point when you can be artistic and they pay you <laughs> that's great um, but I was drawn to music video. Well, I mean, I guess I was always doing music videos. I love short format. So short filmmaking is like I have two festival pieces that are out right now. Murder is one of them. I have another one called Everyday Love that's like much more like traditional cinema. Um, and I have another one in the can called Drab. Uh, but yeah, music videos, it, it really depends what people are looking for in the end of them. I, my uh, other film mentor, Emily Pelstring, who teaches cinematography at Queen's, um, 
and she got me really going with music videos. We did a bunch of US Girls videos. I don't know if you guys know US Girls. They're amazing, check them out. Um, and she, like, because I would go to her and be like, how, it's so hard to edit these. There's, it's a story and I have, I have three minutes. You know, I'm trying to create the world of a narrative in three minutes. I have three days of footage. And she's like, you gotta stop shooting so much, you know? Um, and she just said, she's like, listen, it's one beautiful image, cut to the next beautiful image, cut on a beat. Like, it's not rocket science. Like, get in there and do it. <laughs> and that's kind of what the partner video was. Like, that was, yeah. had a concept, literally drove in one day to Windsor. Next day was, had one day to film, had two days to edit, had to deliver it for... And two days of editing? Yeah. And so it, I've gotten to a point where I can just go... And I can really, I know what I'm looking for, you know? Like I know what images are gonna kind of capture people's attention. I can do it quite quickly. But for like my, one of my first big music videos, Emergency for Hylotrons, like that was an entire narrative about a woman struggling with alcoholism. And we put it in this surreal environment where like poker chips are like falling from the ceiling and like, and she's transitioning between a dream landscape and like an AA meeting, um, which were totally theatrical elements we had, you know, that was three days of filming, mm -hmm. big locations, big crews. Uh, and, and that was uh, very hard to edit because it was so trying. So how many days of editing? I'm very curious because yeah. some students in video two, they want to do a music video mm -hmm. and they don't realize. Oh, it takes and take, it can take, it can take a week. It can like, take a week, huh? It can take a week. Yeah. Um, because I work on small budgets, I don't make it take that long because uh, my time is money and uh, I gotta keep, keep things working through. So I do do these, these, these fast edit things. Um, I don't super like to work like that, but it, you know, it, it does depend on the project and the scope of the project. I love super simple music videos that just have a really mm. good concept and, and it can be like done in one take or something really interesting like that. Yeah, I'm just really drawn to music videos. I mean, did everyone see the new Beyonce music video? She filmed in the Louvre. Like, no one has ever filmed in the Louvre before. And, like, these guys did that. And, like, mm -hmm. or uh, the Charles Gambino, This Is America. Like, that changed the face of, like, every professor who's, like, social justice was, was like, I have something to teach from. Like, it's... <laughs> Every frame in that video is like, this is the history of this, this is the history of this concept. This is why this visual is important. This is what the background character here means. This is what it means in traditional Greek theater. Like really, really dynamic like, messaging there. And like just super, super duper well done. Simple, like, and that's supposed to be kind of like a one take video, but you can see the breaks in it, you know? But um, I can't help it. I, every time I look at a video too, I'm just like, I'm like, you could have done that. That's how they did that. This is where this is from. Like, that's not real. This is real. This, you know. Yeah. Um, and in circus, we had three points of focus. So you see that red curtain. That's a miniature in front of the camera. And then there's the actor, like, 10 feet away. And then there's a backdrop, a theater backdrop that my mom painted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, we spoke a lot about um, artistic vision, artistic work. But um, video making, it's, al it's also... Uh, uh, possible because of the team most of the time. Oh, okay. it's all teamwork, I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what kind of challenge did you met, uh, like more on the human side, working with other people? Like, can you explain what is the, some difficult yeah. part, some easy part? Yeah, well, I can even talk about, I think you were probably going to bring this up, like my video one project, and <laughs> it was kind of problematic. <laughs> Hashtag everything is problematic. I still have it. Oh, God. Um, so that was more to do with our subject. Our subject um, was an artist who was just like, I knew through friends, and he kind of manipulated my team. Like, he lied to us about, like, he, at, right before we were about to film, he sent us a message and was like, I can't film. I was just told because I'm working on this very, you know, important painting, like, no one can know that I'm doing it, so I have to pull out your project. And we had already done, you know, three weeks of pre-production. We're like, okay, we respect your decision to not be part of this. Can you write a, a letter that I can submit to my professor? Because I have to find a new artist in two days and do an entire pre-production. And then my roommate, who was the artist assistant, was like, oh no, he was lying. He just wanted to see if you'd still do it and stuff. And then after we finished the project, um, I, you know, I wasn't very proud of it. It was, it was a group effort. It's one of these things where it's like, 
you know, who's the director? I'm like, not everyone's really the director. Like, everyone's kind of like working together and being like, okay, we got the lights, we got the camera. Okay, well, will you sit and ask the questions? Like, yeah, I'll sit and ask the questions. And then I ended up being the director. Um, but because I was credited with that director role and understanding the power it comes with like these different labels, like a director is, is, is the person in traditional film is seen as like the head of the film. Um, whereas like sometimes the lines can be really br blurry. I, I often use like the created by term and I'll put like three people who are the forces behind a project. Like I'm working on a, a mini series about vinyl collecting and we just put like created by these, like me and this other guy because because we both wear the director hat, we both kind of pick up the camera. It's sort of blur, blur lines. Anyway, to finish the first story, really? um, I was happy the project was over, finished the class, got a good mark, getting out of school. Um, and then my roommate later on was like, oh, you know that video you made? I, I see it all the time. And I was like, what do you mean you see it all the time? <laughs> I was really hoping it would never be seen again. Um, and she's like, oh, I make like 100 copies of it a day, and I use it as a part of a promo package for the artistic development of their portfolio. I was like, excuse me? And so that's when the whole idea she of like, me. I was like, she what do I do? Me. I was like, what do I do? Like, this is so weird. I don't, it's mostly like I didn't really want it to go out as like my first directorial debut as like a student art film with this, you know, artist I didn't really like and like, you know, we edited until till, till 2 a.m. the night before it was due. Like, it was not a very great video. Um, and then to know it was being reproduced. And so I had to write him and be like, you know, we, we made this. We hoped you would share it with your friends and family, but we didn't intend for it to be a marketing tool, which is something that people will hire a team, a creative company to do, or even, even a small contractor where it's like that's their job to, like, market the artist. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was like, this is about money. <laughs> you just want money. And I was like, I don't care about money. I just wanted to know that you were doing this. Um, mm -hmm. So that was difficult. And then in terms of like, I've, I've been harassed on a, on a film set last year. I had a sound tech who um, I knew had a history of, of um, different uh, working behavioral things. And I was feeling, you know, like I could trust them. And I, I believe that they were working on themselves and stuff. And I, I worked with them and then I was harassed for about two months. I had to um, contact a lawyer and deal with it that way. Um, that's not fun. Uh, it really, really affected me personally, in my personal life. Um, and, and do you think that women yeah. still have some struggle in the film industry, for example, here, like around you? Well, so, so what kind of problem I just, you may had, like in the past, mm -hmm. just to to grow and to advance, so is there any problem related to your genre? To no, I, I've I've been like you know a leading force in, in my work, and and I, I would say that <laughs> the things that I am oppressed by are the things are the systemic things that I can't see. Um, you know, I don't get called up every day to work on stuff. I don't get called up as a as a cinematographer. I don't get called up as a camera operator. Um, I make my projects happen. People come to me who want to work with me, who know me, who have a reputation. Uh, I'm on a couple of good like lists locally, so my, you know my, I'm doing well in my company. But it is difficult um, to, to, especially in different kind of technical fields where there's not a lot of representation behind the camera. Be it like women, be it people of color, like it's just like an old white man's game. And it's very hand to hand, it's very hand to mouth. So people are like, everyone's trying to get the money, which is hand to mouth. And then it's very hand to hand, it's like, oh, I got a buddy. Oh, my buddy's buddy. Oh, my buddy's got a buddy, and that's my buddy. And the, the easiest thing for humans to do is the only way that I can rationalize this out is that like, it's just easier for people to use their trusted networks, aka people that look like them. And I kind of throw that shit out the window. I make a very strong point. I've been a, you know, a, a outspoken and, and, you know, prominent member of like the women in music community, uh, women in tech. Um, I wrote a sound tech manual for DIY women in sound tech, um, and of which the women who take that course are now I'm hiring them, which is okay. really cool. They're like, oh, I took the sound tech course and I'll just see them working sound at a gig. And I'm like, you need some work? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I'd love to work at Phil. And I'm like, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's, I create, create my own hand-to-hand -hand community of like my backlist of contractors where 
I represent a lot of people that aren't traditionally seen behind the camera. Um, and I really am proud of that. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, and so when I step into these older institutions like the NAC, for instance, I do a lot of work recording music artists at like the fourth stage and, and that stuff. So, you know, every tech behind the stage is, is, a, is a white man. And, and so I bring in my crew of like people who don't look like them. And they're awesome. Like everyone is very friendly and upfront and excited to work with us. But we're not going to get a call later that week being like, hey, saw you, let's work together. Like I, you know, I get my own gigs and I, I barrel through, but um, yeah. And I also founded a program for video tech for young girls. It ran in tandem with Rock Camp for Girls. Now it's running in tandem with the Girls Plus Skate 613, which is really cool. They're making skateboarding music videos. I was like, ah, I couldn't, I'm going to residency, so I was supposed to teach it, but I can't. But I just think that would be the most fun ever is like, I made a, a fun like ladies skate uh, music video a lot, two summers ago, super fun. I love skateboarding. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would like to know now more about your current project and the future project. So what's the on, the, on the plate? So uh, I'm working on a mini series, like a web-based uh, mini series about vinyl collecting. And it's part travel log and part game show. So we give two DJs 50 bucks, 24 hours, and then we kind of follow them around different cities. So we've done it here. It's our pilot. We've done it in Montreal. We have Toronto slated. We have New York slated. Um, and those are, we, we film for two days, just get as much as we can, and then we edit it. Um, and, and so the impetus of the game show is to actually go into these different locales and like find out the best record shops, talk to those record shop owners, talk to the community radio hosts, talk to the old DJs. You know, what, what was the genre that this area is known for? Like in Montreal, we went uh, to try and unearth like classic Quebec disco. Um, so we talked to these DJs from like the 70s and the 80s. It's super, super interesting. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for Dollar Bin DJ is the name of that project. Um, I'm working on a, a local profiling series called uh, Our Athenas, and it's to highlight the work of local self-identified women, mm -hmm. um, which I think they're, they might open up. Uh, and so that's an interesting, like, they're just like picture profiles of like, the first one was about a florist who did all the plants on the wall at Black Squirrel. If you've seen those, uh, she does arrangements and just her day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but we recently featured uh, Marissa Gelmet, um, who does, who has a film, who used to be a filmmaker, but has transitioned into making large textural mm -hmm. um, piece, like installation sculptures. Um, I do a music series at the Record Center called Tiny Stage, which is an interview-based Mm -hmm. um, uh, series, and then I have a short film called Drab, okay. with which Matt? is, with Matt? oh, with Matt, <laughs> working, with Matt I'm working on, so I have a, uh, can you tell them who's yeah. Matt? Okay, so Matt Miwa is uh, my creative collaborator who I worked with at the Bytown and who had to push me with two hands <laughs> into, into filmmaking, really, um, because he's so afraid of cameras. He came and he's like, I don't want to touch a camera, I don't know what they do, you know, but he, a director and he loves the stage um, and he's a drag performer and a performance artist uh, so our first piece was called Captain Sorelsky and the Woman in Search of Space Gold and so it was like a sci-fi sexy comedy and so we actually had a, a film festival contact us because we, we did it pretty well in like queer film festival circuit and a film festival contacted us and we were like when is Space Gold 2 coming out so we're looking at going back to space but, uh, and our second piece was Murder at the Circus, which was to kind of capture, like, um, it was, it's to do with awe and death, really. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really supposed to be, it's supposed to be kind of more like a horror piece. Um, and then recently Matt wrote me, and he was like, I am Catwoman. <laughs> and so he's like, he has a garbage bag cat suit that he makes and like <coughs> high heels. And he like, he's like, I want to prowl around. So we're working on this like a, a kind of like Michelle Pfeiffer, Catwoman mm -hmm. uh, performance piece where he fights another cat. Um, but yeah, so when, we, when I work with Matt, I work with different artists and we kind of have a, our own portfolio together. So like um, Space Gold and Circus uh, and this Catwoman piece will be in that kind of portfolio. And, and uh, we have this, uh, we, ha we, we kind of like to take genres and just destroy them. So we have another piece called uh, 
Scheduled to Die, which is like going to be a buddy cop comedy piece uh, where it's supposed to be like film noir, but it's like everything, everyone just pretend the clock hits midnight, like the next person is scheduled to die. <laughs> um, but in my own work, I, I'm, I'm finishing up this piece called Drab, which is like a black and white psychedelic road movie, and it's going to be brought together by different pieces of like Canadian music that I love. Um, and we filmed, I blew half my budget on buying like an old Cadillac, um, yeah, 1979 um, Delegance, and we painted it matte black. Uh, my uncle owns a drive-in movie theater in Pembroke, so we... We uh, painted it there, and we filmed some stuff in the country, but we drove from PEI, we filmed in Quebec City, Montreal, and then rural Ontario, and I have one more scene to film here in a bar. It's like a bar fight, but uh, I kind of had to shelf a bunch of stuff while I was like, I ran out of money, <laughs> so I'm applying for another grant for it. Um, but if I don't get it, I'm going to try and complete it this summer. Uh, and yeah. any future film in your mind? like? We talk about that. And yeah, uh, yeah. Like a, a feature film is a is a big dream, huh, for any filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, do you have this big dream? Definitely have the big dream. Definitely will do it. Definitely have to, because again, like t t it's a team. I have to build a good team of people who are either willing to work on like a sliding scale or. Or we just make it happen, um, or we just we can try and do the circuit of like pitching to different production companies and, and trying to get it get it done. But yeah, for a feature film, I really want to do like a, like a feminine based melodrama around like the lives of some women um, that would just be kind of like just super dramatic and super outrageous uh, to do with some of my family history. I'm writing a play with my mom. Um, I have another piece that's kind of based around a country singer falling in love with another country singer, mm -hmm. um, and it's it, that I, it was would be more like a cabaret. Mm -hmm. Kind of saw that as a as a play mixed with video. I I kind of see video. I mean, it's just a tool. Like short filmmaking is a part of like festival film circuits. It's a part of programming, but it's for me, it's just one part of my artistic practice. So bringing cameras onto the stage and incorporating projection art. Um, I have mm. a mentorship in projection art mm -hmm. that I, I finished last year um, because, again, it's a part of my toolkit and projection is like, a, it's not like the final frontier, but it is going to be the next major, major, major um, thing in, in video. Mm -hmm. So I want to be there with that. So projection as a part of performance, projection in films, with uh, Drab, what we, we wanted to do, because we couldn't bring the old car all the way to PEI. Oh. We only brought it to Montreal. Um, we filmed a lot of the landscapes and a lot of like the, the roadways. <laughs> and then we did the classic Hitchcock trick of we projected that footage. We put the car in front of it in this big old parking lot. And we filmed it. That was an interesting tech, tech challenge because it was new to have these higher powered digital projectors with a digital sensor camera. Because um, we, we were using the new cam the new mm -hmm. camera at the time was Black Magic, uh, uh, and then we were receiving really strange video feedback, and I was like, it was the last day of filming. I thought I was going to lose my mind. Like, it was like the worst thing. I was like, this is the end, you know. Um, but you know, we just Googled it, <laughs> which is what you do, and we changed the frequencies. Thanks. No problem. Looks beautiful. It's so interesting that you can do these things and oh. So we look forward to see this uh, this project. Yeah. And let us know. When I will. It's going I will. To I will. Be, uh, screen uh, locally. Yeah. We are very close to the end. Oh, okay. This wonderful artist talk. Uh, I enjoy a lot the moment. And you? Do you enjoy? Yeah, the moment. Um, do you have any advice for these uh, future filmmakers? I'm sure everyone would be a Someone's filmmaker in the future. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any advice for them, like to start in, a, to start somewhere, somehow? Well, to, to start somewhere somehow is to uh, I always just be like, follow your dreams. Um, but but seriously, follow your dreams. Do don't don't stop. Just keep going. If if you encounter a challenge, overcome it and do something else. Try <laughs> something new. Uh, and if you have an idea, remember that everyone else's idea that you see on the screen is 
not that it's so much better than your own. It's just that they haven't heard your idea yet. You know, like your ideas are just as good as anybody else's. They just have access to these different tools and mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But your ideas could be even better. So don't ever, I feel like a lot of the own barriers I created for myself were somewhat cultural, um, thinking that I didn't see myself represented. And it was like, no, there are amazing filmmakers out there that are just like you. And you're no different from them. So think of your ideas as great ideas. And that don't let form stop you. And by that, I mean, don't let a tool like not having access to a camera or not having access to the exact camera that you want mm -hmm. stop you. Grab anything, because you can film on anything now. And it will be great. We see like, oh my gosh, like film shot on uh, Tangerine, made with an iPhone 5. Like, you can do that. You might have a better idea. Yeah. So um, we are open. For one, two questions from the public, if you have any question, and uh, and I will have to repeat the question to record the question. Don't be shy. <laughs> oui? I have a question, but I'm not like a student. Vas-y, uh, vas-y, yes. Yeah, I, I know a friend who's, in his words, has reached that point where he wants to try a feature. Um, and like the advice you just offered, so I wrote this down. Like, <laughs> like I'm gonna repeat this like motivational speech you just gave. Yeah. I'll give you credit. <laughs> it's, um, it's cool. Don't reproduce it a hundred times. Yeah. <laughs> no, but simply like, what what has sort of stopped you from like making that leap? Like, why did you take the time you've taken to do it? Like, because I just want to make sure he's mm -hmm. not making that leap too soon. Like, do you think there are certain markers you have to hit? No. Okay. Do you want to repeat the question? No, no. I think the microphone can Is pick up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was good? Yeah. Isabel <laughs> said it was good. So you can pump able. it up. You can pump it up. Um, I heard it in here, so. Um, I, I, again, because the feature film, it depends what the concept is. Because if the concept is like one person in a room, like you, you can make that pic picture. And if you have an audience, like if, you, if, if the story is going to connect with somebody else, someone is going to pick that up. And there's an audience for that, you know? Like we have, there's so many small scale, mm -hmm. like, film festivals these days that are looking for interesting content. Um, and so I, you know, the things that have prevented me from doing a feature are a lot to do in part financial, but also because I really want to develop the script and I really wanted to, because my ideas are very big and they involve many people, um, it, it's just a longer process because I got to finish a script, got to bounce it off some people, got to got to start looking for actors that I really want to work with. Because um, I'm not just going to choose random people. Uh, I, I, you know, it's so, it's, it's a good question. But I, I just feel like just to keep, just to don't stop, just to keep, keep putting those little things in place. But don't ever think that you have to do a successful anything before you can do the project that you really want to do. Just do the project you really want to do. I mean, there are, there are those filmmakers, and this is the only thing I would war wary against, would be to keep remaking the same project over and over and over again. Because it's tempting. It's tempting to never leave the editing room. It is hard as a director-editor to feel that something is complete. Murder took three years to edit because we used experimental performance pieces because that was the process we wanted to work within. We wanted to elicit the emotion that we would, that you know, we could tell, like, okay, does it look like the strong man is going to leave? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, is the fortune teller looks like she's, she's got that look. Like we did these emotional performances, and we had to sit with the, with the actors because Matt has a really specific process. He wanted to work with um, non actors because he was sick of yeah, he and like he would yell these things on set, and I would be like, what the fuck, dude? He would be like, stop acting, <laughs> because he didn't want to work with professional actors. He wanted to work with people that didn't know about acting, so would have like these unconscious emotional reactions that wouldn't be so staged. He got so sick of working in the theater world that he, he was like, no, immediate performance and improv was the only way to move forward as an artistic concept. That's him. But yeah, don't, 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 don't get stuck in the same idea. 
I would say, is just go for it. Yeah. Do we have another question? Merci, Leslie. Thank you. Do we have another question? No? So, merci beaucoup, ma chère. Thank you. Yes. Bisous. <laughs> All right. Have a good day, everybody.